John Gonzalez uh, used to work here locally uh, for the uh, Philadelphia Papers and the Inquirer, mm-hmm. and he used to write the column. And now he's with the Ringer. Yeah, I met him at the Phillies press box. He hogged, he stole my seat, he took my internet cord. That's how long ago it was. There was a cord for the internet. Well, he joins <laughs> us now on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. Uh, his uh, colleague at the Ringer, Ben Dietrich, was the one who found out the curious case of Brian Colangelo and the secret Twitter account, which. I know, Gonzo, this is a story that you probably have popcorn all over your apartment or house or wherever you live that uh, you are just hanging by everything here. How are you, man? Gentlemen, wonderful to talk to you. Pete, did I take your cord? I didn't know that. <laughs> uh, not that I have a long memory or anything. No, He's I holding love, grudges. I love you, pal. You know that. That, <laughs> that was the first time. And, of course, I might you might have taken my cord, but I was taking up half of the, the extra seat. I was like, you know, one plus half. So, you know, it all worked out. It's perfect. <laughs> I, I'm glad it worked out. Um yeah, guys, I'm at uh, I'm in uh, Oakland slash San Francisco for the finals, and I can tell you that uh, n- not only do I have my popcorn, but the entire league does. I mean, it's the only thing at at media day yesterday that anybody was talking about. It was fascinating. I was going to say, so you're at the NBA finals. You got LeBron James for the fourth time playing the Warriors, and the only thing this league is talking about. You're there is the 76ers and Brian Colangelo. I'm telling you, it is. Like, if you're a reporter, if you are a team functionary, you know, if you're a trainer, uh, a player, the general managers, like, everybody is talking about this all across the league. Because how could you not? It's fascinating. And, like, you know, now you're starting to see people talk about, like, other – because uh, evidently there's a lot of people with burner accounts, and you're starting to hear other people go, oh, I wonder if, you know, so-and-so shut down their burner account, or I don't have any burner accounts, and everybody's making jokes about it. So – yeah, it's a hot topic for sure. You know, Gonzo, it's funny you say that because I yesterday, talking to just about every NBA person that we've talked to over the last 48 hours, is that I'm now finding out that people do have these second accounts. Now, one thing that one of the guys told me was, you know, look, I have a second account that I look at food trucks and just things that interest me that I don't want clogging up my, my timeline. Like, I never thought about it like that, but the fact that this is kind of norm. But is it norm that NBA executives – would have a fill a one two three four five six seven that's basically dormant and just kind of policing things. Uh, no, I mean, like I know that there were previously general managers who you know would have it. Like it's not unusual that the fill account, the original account that he was using to just sort of like sniff around the internet. That's not unusual. Uh, there are plenty of front office executives, not just general managers, who do that kind of thing. What is, however, highly unusual is that it was linked to, as we now know, several other accounts that were very, very critical of uh, the previous administration, of current players, of um, you know trades that didn't go through and why. Uh, so, yeah, that part is beyond the pale. John, when you look at – okay, you were here covering this whole process and then the change – can you now, if this is allegedly Brian Colangelo or somebody in his circle, does it stem essentially from jealousy of the previous regime or just insecurities of his career, of how he got this job? Like, how would it get to this for someone to get to this point if it is, in fact, someone in his circle or him himself? Yeah, and I want to be clear that I know as much as you guys do that we don't know for sure if it was absolutely him. I think that uh, Ben lays out a really good case. There are too many coincidences for me to believe that uh, Brian didn't know about this. And I think the big thing is, you know, the damning thing is that when they called the Sixers and asked about the two accounts, they didn't tell them about the other three accounts, which almost simultaneously and immediately went private. So when Brian says that, hey, these aren't my accounts. Okay, they might not be, but when Brian says, I don't know who's doing this and someone's out to get me and he's trying to spin it, that's the part I don't believe. You, If it's not you, you know who it is because those accounts went private immediately after you were told. So I think it is somebody, if it's not him, it's somebody very close in his inner circle. There's you know a lot of uh, working theories on, the, on Twitter about whether or not it's his wife, but uh, I think he knows for sure and I think he's not telling the truth. A um, couple things. One, if it is him or his wife or someone in his circle, that's awful. But the alternative is a deranged fan or somebody who's probably a hinkyite. The faith in humanity is concerning to see that that's the case. Yeah, I mean, here's here are the possibilities. 
the possibilities are this is a conspiracy to get Brian Colangelo that's like reached uh, Robert Mueller level Russia investigation mm-hmm. status or it's Brian Colangelo and somebody he knows and he's, and they were really stupid about it. Right. I tend to go the Occam's razor route and think, you know, the simplest <laughs> solution is uh, the simplest answer is the right one. And that's what I think we have here. I think we have a guy who uh, is very sensitive and people around him are, are sensitive on his behalf and they did a stupid thing and they got caught. Does him texting Schultz essentially saying, I'm, I'm getting set up here, to not come out and have a presser or anything like that, does that does that make him look better, worse, awful, okay? I mean, of all the things you would do, you text Schultz and say, I'm getting set up here? I mean, does that, does that feel like a pretty weak cry for my innocence? I think he's trying to spin and fix this thing before it gets out of control. But, like, well, what happens here, right? Like, he goes and he issues this statement, and if the Sixers believed him, they would have said, we stand by him. This is ridiculous. It's not him. This is not his character. You know, we're fully behind Brian Colangelo. Instead, they launched an investigation. I think that they think exactly what the rest of us think, that despite Brian leaking this and saying somebody's out to get me, uh, that they look at this and go, there's too many things here that don't add up, and it doesn't feel like you're being truthful, and we're going to have to investigate this. So uh, to your point about like whether or not he should have a press conference or something, oh, my God, I would love that. I would love <laughs> to be in that press conference because I have a lot of questions, and I'm going to guess he would get eaten alive, and he wouldn't have good answers for any of them. But, yeah, please, let's have that happen. I mean, we all remember, just real quick, John, when he went on with Barkan one-on-one at one point in time, and, and Barkan, who maybe isn't – uh, Mike Wallace, right? Barkan kind of brushed him aside pretty hard and pretty embarrassingly. I mean, look, Barkan is very smart and very nice and, like, very rarely sinks his teeth because he doesn't have to, right? He's Michael Barkan. And so that tells you everything. Like, yeah, Barkan went and, like, asked him a bunch of tough questions and Jerry uh, or Brian couldn't handle them. And now I wonder, like, what would happen if, he does have a press conference in full view of everybody. Next time, either they're going to get rid of him or he's going to have to materialize at some point. And if it is the latter, that at some point is going to be appointment dealing. I, I will fly across the country from wherever I am to enter that press conference. So what are some of the questions, Gonzo, that you'd have for Brian Colangelo in a press conference like that? Well, absolutely. The number one thing would be, okay, you said – that you don't have any knowledge of this and that somebody is out to get you and it's, this is disturbing to you. So explain to me how you were the only person who was informed about the first two accounts, which then caused the, the, the other three accounts to immediately and simultaneously go private. How is that possible? How is it possible that all these accounts are linked and that you didn't know about it? How is it possible that uh, you, the proprietary information about trades and potential uh, failures of physicals with Julio Okafor were mentioned uh, on these Twitter accounts. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that only Brian Colangelo and his closest confidants would have. So either he's lying about not knowing, or he's lying about being involved, or conversely, he didn't know about any of this and he's incompetent. N- none of these things go well for him. I mean, like, put, put all of us in front of him, and I would love to see him answer these questions. Now, Mike asked you about, is there anything... Uh that makes you feel that Colangelo could be set up? Any evidence that you've kind of seen or observed, John Gonzalez, that makes you feel like it is some guy with an ax to grind or some hinkyite out there that's really built this elaborate scheme? Uh, And somehow linked the accounts together? No, (laughs) no. And, And somehow also knew? despite the fact that only two people in the organization, uh, the Sixers PR representative who was reached out to by the ringer and then subsequently went and talked to Brian Colangelo, only two people knew about the first two accounts when we asked them about them, and then all of a sudden this conspiracy theory person who's out to get Brian Colangelo knew about it and then shut down the other three accounts to widen uh, you know, the attack against, against Colangelo. No, I, I think that that is wildly, wildly beyond belief and, and it's strange credulity and also like anything that's like even, I mean, this would be, this would be some really top level NSA kind of stuff. And I don't think Brian Colangelo, hmm. despite being one of just 30 general managers, warrants that kind of take. Now, I mean, his wife has been brought in, which is unfortunate. Uh, his father's name has been mentioned, but I, I can't imagine Jerry sitting around doing this. His son, 
Uh, there's a lot of circles of people who have been insinuated to be a part of this. But if, in fact, it was somebody that Brian had no knowledge of, can the Sixers say, look, he didn't know we're going to move on with Brian? Uh, or is there any scenario in the end that, save for some guy coming out and saying, look, I set this guy up, it's me, I, 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 I admit it, is there any scenario that he can get out of this drafting on June 25th. It saves him finding a fall guy to come out and take the heat for this. I can't imagine that the Sixers keep him around because look, what did you, what happened the night of, right? You had Joel Embiid, like in a normal situation, in a normal circumstance, players would just talk about among themselves about this. But on top of that, you've got Joel Embiid, who's Joel Embiid and go is, is openly goofing on the guy on Twitter. And this has become a, and I cannot strain this, enough emphasize this enough a national nba story everybody league-wide is talking about this players are talking about this you're about to go not even just into the draft what about free agency if you, the, the sixers have a massive offseason coming up they're gonna have to court players do you want to go play for a guy who might be throwing shade at you from fake accounts and then denying it i mean accounts that were linked to him to his one account that he admitted to, linked to. All you had to do was toggle on Twitter and he would see the other accounts, but all of a sudden he doesn't know about them? I mean, come on. Like, it's one thing to do this, and it's another thing to spit in everybody's eye and say, you know, they're stupid and you don't know where this came from. Maybe the biggest offseason in franchise history. John Gonzalez with us here talking Sixers and Brian Colangelo. So what do you make, Gonzo, of the Joel Embiid tweets? Do you think Embiid believes that Brian Colangelo, in fact, actually feels Ooh, that way about him? That's juicy. I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, obviously, Joel was having some uh, some fun at Brian's expense on this one. Uh, as we have come to expect from uh, Joel, that's kind of his M.O. But he did tweet at the very end that Brian reached out to him. And in all seriousness, I don't believe that it's him because if it was, it would be awfully crazy. I think, you know, that's, that's Joel being uh, – you know, like kind of straddling the line there, being a little clever and saying, hey, you know, he said it's not, and I believe him, but what if it is? So I don't know. I think that there's going to be a lot of doubt. I don't know how that he, he possibly clears his name on this one. Uh, and it'll be fascinating to see how quickly the Sixers wrap up their internal investigation. So what are some of the NBA people that you've talked to out there at the finals? Uh, is there anyone that sees him getting through this? Are they shocked? Are they surprised? Like, give us some of the reaction. And also, if anybody sees, like, because Mike and I always talk about the path to victory when we're analyzing games. Is there a path to staying employed for Brian Colangelo? Uh, if there is, not a lot of people are talking about it. I can tell you that the predominant conversations that I'm having with people around the league after, you know, on background and on record, after you, after everybody goes, you know, OMG, couple of curse words. Can you believe how crazy this is? The very next part of the conversation everybody is having is, hey, who do you think is going to be the new GM? And there are a lot of names being floated around right <laughs> oh, now. Man. Um, if, in fact, the investigation, let's say it takes a week, two weeks, just throwing that out there. Um, if, in fact, it takes a week or two weeks, can they pick themselves up quick enough to get somebody in here to clean themselves of this and be a viable free agent landing spot, or is that tainted? Is the in other words, is the Sixers organization tainted, or is it just Colangelo who would be tainted if, in fact, he is a part of all this? No, I think like if it, if they decide that you know he knew, or it was him, or he wasn't being truthful and they move on and they get somebody else in there. Like I said, I've heard heard uh, a couple of names being bandied about. There's some uh, leading uh, candidates in the clubhouse right now. I think that if they distance themselves from Brian Colangelo and this whole escapade, that then all of a sudden they're an attractive destination again, right? Because they do have Joel Embiid, mm -hmm. and they do have Ben Simmons, and they do have a nice young core and cap space, and they just made the uh, Eastern Conference semifinals, and they're a team on the rise. There's no doubt about it. So uh, they've got a beautiful new – uh, practice facility, all signs point to them being an attractive destination, minus all of the nonsense. Um, I know you were here. Were, were you still in Philly, Gonzo, when the changeover, when the Colangelos were introduced to the Harrises? Oh, was I? Yeah, I'll <laughs> never forget that press conference after they that, – that, that was the kind of press conference that I, I die for, that I love, because when they saw Josh Harris in front of us and Josh Harris tried to explain to us – 
why they were switching over and that they hadn't forced Sam out and all this stuff. He was ill prepared for it. And I think similarly that Brian would be, but yes, I was there and that was a hell of a, that was an all timer. That was an all timer. So at this stage, would you surmise that the NBA would feel some egg on their face in this situation if, in fact, this went down unfair or poorly for Colangelo? That's it. That's very interesting. Uh, Adam Silver is set to give his state of the NBA address today. Will this, will this question come up before a finals question? Uh, my guess is that finals questions will be first. Even even though it was the hot topic of the conversation yesterday, uh-huh. uh, this particular thing was asked in public on the record towards the end of most uh, media sessions. So my guess is that somewhere, somewhere after the predominant prevailing, you know, competition, health of the league, finals questions will be, hey, what do you think about this? And uh, by the way, you know, you, you talked about how tanking and Sam Hickey weren't good. For the, for the league and the Sixers had uh, run afoul of you know the usual norms. What do you think about this? Because right. he did help put it in their motion. No question. I mean, you can almost say that if it's not Colangelo or somebody he knows, and it was some deranged fan, it stems from them stepping in and essentially introducing the Colangelos to the Harrises, which put this in motion, and here we are. And a lot of this is because – Here we are in 2018, John, and there's still a divide between the fan base on who gets the most credit, and it almost stems to the jealousy that he would be displaying if this is, in fact, him, which is really ironic. I mean, isn't that much of a debate, though? Like, like, because when you look at what he's done, he gets credit for pulling two guys in Ursan Ilyasova and Marco Bellinelli off of the waiver wire scrap heap, and he he hit jackpot on both of those, which is highly unusual, but good for him. He did it. Uh, he brought in J.J. Redick, threw a bunch of money at him, and stole him away from the Houston Rockets. Good for him. That's a good move. Uh, egg on his face on the Fultz thing so far. And what else has really happened? I mean, like, I, I don't think – he came in with a stacked deck, and there's a reason for that, and he knows and everybody else knows who stacked the deck for him, and I think that that bothers him. No question. Um, you got – there was thought when Sam was here that – People wouldn't deal with him, that he would never be able to get free agents because the agents didn't like him because what he was doing. That Colangelo essentially would give the credibility, and he had the relationships. So do you feel that Colangelo being here would be a reason a high-profile free agent would choose Philadelphia, or is he inconsequential? That is one of the most ridiculous narratives that was peddled when Sam got pushed out the door. That Sam wasn't available, that he was aloof, that people didn't like him. All false. He didn't talk on the record, but he was always available. He's quite personable. He's very funny. Uh, I always thought that that was garbage. I did, however, not know Brian Colangelo. And so I thought, hey, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt because the people that I talked to around the league, when I said, hey, what do you know about Brian? What's he like? To a man, almost. Everybody was like, he's going to be great. The media is going to love him. He's going to come in and do all the stuff that Sam didn't do. Guess what? It was the opposite. I mean, like, you could get Sam on the side to talk. He wouldn't do it on the record, but you could get him. The last time I've seen Brian Colangelo, like, just talking to to a reporter on the side, that doesn't happen. I mean, like, he went into hiding almost immediately. So this idea that he was going to be this great savior and he was going to, you know, leverage all his relationships and people were going to come here because of him and look at how different it will be and open and truthful. And that's something that um, uh, Josh Harris mentioned in the press conference, that they wanted to be more transparent. Well, guess what? Not only were you not more transparent, you were a lot shadier. What information do you have or can you give us about the origins of this story? Uh, I have the same information as everybody else. I encourage you to read the piece. There is a podcast that we put together on The Ringer where uh, Ben Dietrich and Chris Ryan went through exactly what happened, and they were extremely transparent about it, where they said, look, this tipster followed Ben, picked Ben out. Uh, Something similar happened to me last year where uh, I wrote a piece about an electrician who had put a bunch of secret messages in the – in the practice facility, and I didn't know the person who did that until they reached out to me. They had just followed me, uh, read my work, and said, hey, uh, I got a story for you. Are you interested? And just like Ben, I said, absolutely, I am. So that's how it came about. There's somebody out there who was privy uh, to this information, who found Ben, 
Ben then, instead of just taking it on face value, which is something, say, an Anthony Gargano has gotten in trouble for in the past, uh, instead of doing that, he did research and he did reporting and he sat on the story until he had a cold. And that's how good stories are put together. Yeah, that was going to be my follow-up, Gonzo, is that there's people out there that will say, well, the ringer, like, what do they know? Or what kind of vetting process did they do of this source? It's not traditional journalism. And it sounds to me, and plus, if you read the story, which I did, it's layer upon layer upon layer, a preponderance of evidence. Uh, I compared it when I was talking to Mike earlier in the show about that, that movie Spotlight. I mean, like how long it took to set this up and the depth to which he went into to uh, make his story. I I don't think it's quite on the level of taking down the Catholic Church and a pedophilia ring, but it's close. It's very close. Uh, John Gonzalez. I, I, I just want to know who's going to play me in the movie. I hope it's Ruffalo. <laughs> uh, were you? Were, were you? Um, did uh, Ben? Uh, when he got this information, did he come to you and be like, oh, my God, you're not going to believe what was just sent to me? Was there a lot of, like, trepidation, or was this like, oh, my God, look what I have here? Because, I mean, knowing no, that you have good. ties to this whole, I mean, you've been around the story from the beginning, essentially. Uh, I had absolutely nothing to do with this. This was all Ben. He did an excellent job. He and Chris kept it very, very close hold and Interesting. tight. Uh, for, for reasons that you would obviously expect. This is not something you'd want to get out. You don't want another media outlet to pick it up. Right. Uh, what happened was it was Chris and Ben working on this story for a while, and then they looped in other top-tier editors at the uh, Ringer. They went through a, a rigorous, rigorous fact-checking process. Anybody, to Pete's point, who says that, you know, this isn't traditional journalism or where did they get the story, doesn't know a, a damn thing, frankly, about how stories and reporting are put together. This is very, as you said, layered and detailed. And I mean, like he went so deep on the reporting. I'm so impressed with what he and Chris put together and uh, kudos to them because look, readers can draw their own conclusion, but I think that the reporting component of it is damn near unimpeachable. Um, John Gonzalez at the ringer, uh, the NBA show. He's at the NBA finals at underscore John Gons. You can follow him on Twitter for uh, all of his uh, NBA thoughts and other sports musings. Who's going to, uh, what's the, other than Brian Colangelo, what's the uh, main topic of conversation at the finals? Can LeBron and the Cavs give us a good series or are we looking at another sweep? I think like maybe he steals one in Cleveland if we're lucky. Otherwise, I don't think that this is going to go very far. By the way, I feel that I have to at least go back and ask you about Brett Brown and the report that he did get a three-year extension, which unfortunately yep. is getting completely swept under the rug, and I feel terrible that he's not going to get the press conference that he deserves, uh, and it would be apropos for them to give him the press conference and make him yet again take the bullets and throw him out there and make him ask questions, so they can't have a press conference and have him answer these questions, right? So, what an odd situation that has become as well. It has, and it's a shame. Uh, one, I want to say kudos to Brett. Honestly, you know, you cover a lot of people in our line of business, and some people are nice people and some people aren't. Some people are smart, some people are deserving, and others are not. Brett Brown is one of the most genuine people I've ever covered in any sport, at any level, anywhere. He absolutely deserves this. Uh, credit to Brett Brown. I'm super happy for him. I would uh, echo those sentiments. Just a, a, a genuine man. Uh, John Gonzalez. Uh, out on the West Coast, the NBA Finals right here tonight, 97.3 ESPN. Gonzo, thanks a bunch, pal. Guys, always good to talk to you.